So here we are preparing to release version 1.0 of the Empirical Labs Arouser, the first compressor plugin from Empirical Labs. We wouldn't be here if it weren't for the advent of the distressor some 20 years ago. Here's Empirical Labs founder and chief engineer Dave Durr to tell us more. The distressor is kind of the result of my fascination with compression from when I was in a band many, many years ago. And I started a studio and we had an old 16-track, two-inch machine, um, M56. Uh, and that thing had an unbelievable sound. So between those two things and the fact that I finally was able to afford at one point an 1176 and an LA-2A, uh, the Gain Brain 1, um, those three compressors uh, really changed the sound of my studio. So. In that time, there was actually no production on several of those devices. So I wanted to have more and I wanted to find out, as I was working at Eventide a few years before, why did those change my studio? And the answer was some technical stuff, but also some control stuff. Uh, big knobs, stuff like that. So we wanted to capture I wanted to get back some of that sound when I started to go to digital and we created a box that had big knobs, had a look and feel like the old stuff and also offered some of the tape nonlinearities. And with the new technology of ICs, we were able to switch stuff around and pull off some features you could never do 10 years before. How did we get from there to the arousal? We had people wanting the distressor as a plug-in since the beginning. And so it was kind of a no-brainer that we had to do it. The problem was uh, I always learn stuff as time goes by. Why would I limit myself to just the features in the distressor? So I know it, some folks get perplexed by it, but we feel all the stuff we added is an enhancement and of course you get all the badass stuff you get in the doll like presets, recall, all that stuff is just, you can't disavow it any longer. So doing a plug-in of the distressor with enhanced features was a very obvious step. As you know, we took some questions from folks on the internet who wanted to hear from Dave Durr directly. And the first question is from Matt. He wants to know, what aspect of the distressor was the most difficult to capture in the digital realm when creating the arousal? Generally, the attack and decay are a big part of the sound of the distressor. We basically modeled the actual circuit component by component to achieve the sound of the distressor. And unfortunately, when you do that stuff, problems crop up and you end up having to sometimes take shortcuts or uh, a broad model approach, which we tried to avoid. But for instance, the distressor attacks very, very fast and without chomping. Uh, so it's hard to get that smooth attack. That was one of the hardest things. Once we got the attack, uh, it was a matter of spending uh, days grinding out the ratios, the curves. Uh, all, so much of the stuff was very easy. For instance, uh, doing the side chains, EQs, very trivial. Doing the input-output, very trivial, although getting the ranges right is very hard. But generally the attack and decay, the saturation, uh, which is, isn't a huge part of the distressor, basically, became a bigger part in the arouser and we were quite pleased how easy it was to make it even more adjustable. Joshua asks, even with such high expectations, you managed to make the most versatile piece of gear even better. How? That's an interesting question. Once we got the attack and decay right, which we spoke about before, and the curves, the digital domain just offers all kinds of easy, extended features. For instance, the high pass, having that sweepable, very, very trivial, very, quite a bit harder in analog domain. And so it was with many things. Some stuff is so obvious 
Um, even stuff we haven't actually implemented yet, uh, when we put it in, you will go, oh, yeah, they needed that. But generally, uh, just more ratios, very easy to add, more side chain filtering, the parametric EQ, very easy to add. The at mod, which is not adjustable in the distressor, was not very easy to add, but uh, after a couple weeks of tweaking, uh, it became indispensable. So basically, some of the stuff was very, very easy to add, and some of the stuff we just basically extended the range or control upon. Dan says that the manual states there is actually a Class A circuit inside. Can you please explain what that is, how it is achieved, and how it works in relation to hardware Class A devices? A Class A device was originally almost all electronics were Class A. Um, just the nature of electronic progression. Um, usually you start out with these Class A with a single power supply. And what you had to do, uh, if you have ground, and this is your plus power supply, um, what you usually had to do to get a plus and minus signal is bias, this is with no signal. So somewhere in between the rails, you had to bias a point. That is a class A circuit where it's not biased at ground. That's one of the basic definitions of it. So it swang between ground and whatever your rail was. Um, the thing, the reason we even wanted to do that is Class A, as everyone that's been in the industry for a while knows, has a sound. Um, it adds harmonics in a certain way um, that actually improve the sound, especially at low level. What we did is we have in the saturator, uh, we had to do a class A type emulation where basically we had to bias something and it created all kinds of problems. I bet we spent, I mean I hate to talk money, but we probably spent ten to twenty thousand dollars fixing the problems of that resulted from the class A circuit. As an example, uh, some of the offline bounces would have a pop at the beginning because again, it was not biased at zero. So when you punched in, <laughs> you punched in at a voltage and pop, you get a clicker pop. Uh, and it, a lot of guys that do DSP have probably been through this. And of course, stuff pops up that you don't think about. We never really tested the offline bounces nor thought about it. But uh, basically we came up with a workaround um, for that particular situation where the bias was implemented before record could happen, before the bounce would happen. Uh, otherwise, the bias slowly worked up to where it uh, was going to end up. Um, but that was a problem. And again, it's a, it is a part of the sound, especially with low-level stuff right now. You, you will have some even harmonics coming out of the saturator. Um, and that is the result that we were looking for with the Class A circuit. You know, I could bull all day long here, but we're talking about a piece of equipment, and I think if we just pull up the plug-in and apply it to an audio track, I think a whole bunch of questions will be answered without any talking, well, a little bit of talking. And I think you'll get an understanding that you won't get with talking. Go insert the arouser. If you notice, again, for speed, we bring the arouser right up at the top. It starts with the A, so you can immediately find it. Also, notice I am inserting it before the EQ. Normally, I would do it after the EQ, especially if I was boosting highs. In this case, I'm actually cutting the highs, so I'm going to put it before the EQ.
although it really won't make much difference. Lastly, I'm going to up the ratio one notch to eight to one, one of my favorite, and I'm going to put the unit in bypass because we're going to have to match some levels here. With a compressor, it is very useful to compare the bypass level and the unbypass level and make them match to your ear. To match levels, we will usually use just the output knob as this is a knee compressor and the input will not matter so much. So you're going to be using this knob here to match the unbypassed with the bypass level. Also, don't forget our handy direct entry. To get back to where I was, which was at 8 dB, you can just double click the middle of the knob, type in 8 and enter, and voila, you're right back. Very useful. The compression amount is done by the input knob alone. Uh, other things will affect it a little bit, but for our purposes on this demo, just the input is all you're going to need to adjust. Again, let's return this to the minus four it was when we started. And lastly, we're not going to use the mix control at all. A mix control is useful if you really want to maintain dynamics for natural sounds. But uh, we're going for a pop sound, and besides, real men don't use the blend control. As a footnote, you'll notice that the text turns red on the blend control, clearly indicating that you are submixing with a dry signal. This can indeed keep you out of trouble. Alrighty, let's go match the bypass to the unbypassed signal and start tweaking the vocal compression. Now that we have a basic sound going, I'm going to make a few offline tweaks. First, I'm going to increase the compression by about 1 dB. I'm going to also shorten the release just a few milliseconds to 200 milliseconds. That'll bring the vocals a little more into your face. I'm going to also go down here to detector high pass. I'm going to turn that up to about 100. Uh, I'll just type it in, it's quicker. And when we do this playback, I'm going to go over here to the soft clipping section. And I'm going to adjust the saturation upward. Right now we're not really hitting it at all. And as I do, I want you to listen and watch this bar graph here. And there you have a pretty dang fine vocal sound. Pretty easy. By the way, all the compression on this track is all arousers. Uh, we'll do a pan here at the end. You can see the whole thing as we play the outro and you get to hear the finished vocal settings. Empirical Labs is proud to announce the full release of our arouser plugin, Rev. Mr. Ray.